Good morning, Cherry Cross United Church. Good morning. I hope everyone is doing fantastic today. Uh, Shauna just handed me this note that I want to read to you based on uh, our Wednesday night um, play that we did. And she says this. I can't thank everyone enough for all the help in so many ways with the dessert theater. There was so much fun and laughter. I felt so good coming home. Thanks to everyone's support, we should have funds for the Sunday school to get through the next year. She said after a few expenses, the Sunday school account now has $305 to put into it. So what a wonderful news that is, is we had some fun here on Wednesday night, and there was a lot of extra dessert. We still got some at our house. Um, did, did we find other people to take dessert home? Oh yeah. Is there still dessert today? <laughs> Not today? Alright, no dessert today. If you're online though with us as well, welcome to you watching on YouTube. Um, and if you follow us on Facebook and social media and all those kind of social media stuff, you won't miss any of our services even if you aren't here. So make sure that you uh, are following us and like the video so we know that you're watching. I would like to invite up the Vervain family to do our Advent wreath lighting, please. Come, let us go up the mountain to the house of God, so that we can be taught God's way and go on God's path. What do you hope for in the new world? I hope for a future that is more amazing than anything I can ever imagine. I hope for the Chapter 3 of Colossians, 
And we're even reading the first verse of chapter 4. Now, some of these things that Paul says in these verses are really challenging, I think, for us to hear in our modern world with our modern ear. But I think Paul's really actually challenging the societal norms of his day, what was good and acceptable in his own way. Uh, we might wish that he challenged it a bit more than he does, but we'll talk a little bit about maybe why and reasons why he doesn't push the envelope further than he does as we talk about kind of the family structure of Paul's day versus the family structure of all our day and what we can take from these passages, which again might be challenging for us to hear, but can teach us and lead us to some really good things. But uh, let's pray. God, we come to you in worship today, Lord, just asking for your presence to be among us. That your Holy Spirit, God, may open our hearts and minds to the things you want us to hear the things you need to teach us and the ways you want to lead us, Lord. Be with us in our homes and in our families as we talk about the family structure of 2,000 years ago and relate that to our family structure today. And, and not just the family, God, but, but the community at large as a church, as a town, as a city, as a nation. We just pray, Lord, that you will be with all of us in this place and that you will be with those who are present with us and watching online as well. We pray all this in the name of Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing another song this morning from the Voice of United hymn book, number 56, a Christmas song, though I, uh, not as well known as some of the other ones. Jesus, our brother, please uh, sing with us.
children and anybody else who feels a little young at heart today want to come forward for a quick lesson. You can stay there too. I, I don't care. <laughs> sometimes you want to come up, sometimes you don't. Yeah, let's, we're, we'll get it. There's offering plates at the back. You guys want to bring those up with you? They're just on the table back there. The offering plates. There's two of them. <laughs> and then I've got some questions for you. We're going to be bringing these, we're going to try to bring these to the front from now on uh, each day as we worship so that we know that they're here. All right, I've got a question for you, all of you and maybe all of you as well. I don't know, they, they're not sure where they want to go today, are they? <laughs> all right. You can sit right there, you can sit right there, you can sit right there. I just have a question. Do you guys, girls, do you have any rules at your house? You can sit down. Nobody, they, they don't know what they want to do, that's cool. Do you have any rules at your house? Yeah, what kind of rules do you have at your house? No animals in the house. No animals in the house. Okay, well, and that, that doesn't include you three, obviously. No, okay. What other rules do we have in our house? Some rules are ne in the negative, right? Don't do this. Are there rules of things you should do? Brush your teeth, I just heard. Are you, is that a rule in your house, to brush your teeth? Yeah, what about making your bed? Yeah, no? Hannah says no, but Myla says yes. What about cleaning your room? Yes, a couple of yeses and noes. Why do you think we have rules in houses? Why do you think your parents give you rules? It's because it helps the family function. And if you left your rooms dirty all the time, you wouldn't have a floor to step on or a bed to sleep in because your toys would be everywhere. And all of you, of course, if you've had kids in your house ever, you made rules, didn't you? Made rules about what you could do in some cases, what you couldn't do in others. Make your bed. Don't use bad language. Don't hit your sister. Hug your sister. Those kinds of rules, right? We make rules in our houses all the time to help the family function and help the household work. And what happens when we don't follow those rules sometimes? Do we maybe get in trouble? We get disciplined a little bit? Maybe they, they take something away or don't allow us to do something, our mom and dad? And the Bible says that children are supposed to obey their parents. And that's important. I told that to Jasper this week and he said, Dad, he doesn't really say that. <laughs> he was doubtful. But I can promise you it does. We're going to be talking about it a little bit later, about the family structure and about why children are supposed to obey those par their parents, but also what wives and husbands are supposed to do and other relationships in the family structure of 2,000 years ago as well. I'm going to say a quick prayer and you can all head upstairs and we'll uh, dedicate this offering. God, thank you, Lord, for our families and the children and all those who are feeling young at heart today and even old at heart for that matter as well. We thank you for their presence and for this place of worship, God, and thank you to those who brought an offering and a gift to you, Lord, a tithe that you might use those gifts, God, that we offer here today for the benefit of, of not only this church congregation and this church community, but the community around us that we may go out into the world and spread the good news as uh, Christmas approaches. We pray all this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. You can all head upstairs, and then we've got a choir song. Thank you, choir. I'm going to grab that. That's my dad. Uh, Did you eat clicker, Kevin? I meant to print this out and get some way to read it, but I definitely forgot to print it out. Does anybody want to volunteer to read that? One verse, and we're reading it all Sundays coming forward, and I'm going to pick somebody out of the crowd every week. Although it'll be before, not, not during. Does anybody want to read that for us? Nice and loud? I'll read it. Kevin will read it. Thank you, Kevin. A child has been born to us. God has given a son to us. He will be responsible for leading the people. His name will be Wonderful Counselor, Powerful God, Father who lives forever.
forever, Prince of Peace. Thank you, good sir. Five dollars in your goodwill spot. <laughs> there you go. You, you can make money, although it's pretend money. Don't count too much on it. So family structure, that's part of what we're kind of talking about today on uh, Microsoft PowerPoint when I looked at just their kind of family pictures. That was one of just the pictures that came up. So there's a happy family picture. But I think it's probably safe to say as we get into this message that society has changed a lot since Paul wrote this letter to the Colossian church. Some things that Paul's world viewed as good and acceptable practices, we today would find abhorrent in some situations, and in some cases even consider it illegal, because some of the things are illegal today. Because of this, some of the things we're about to read as Paul ends chapter 3 might make us a little bit uncomfortable. We might squirm a little bit when we hear some of these words from Paul. Because we view the family structure today quite differently, I think, than they did in Paul's day. So today's message, it's a little bit of a different focus because we're really going to dig deep into the context of these verses and kind of why Paul is saying what he's saying because the context here really matters to understand what he is saying and not just shrug it off as, as utter nonsense that serves no good purpose for us in the 21st century here in Canada. So we're, as I've been doing for this series, we're going to split this up into three sections because Paul talks about three family relationships and, and how they should function. And so we're going to split them up into those three and, and look at them each individually, some a little bit longer than others. And the relationships that Paul deals with are family relationships of his day, the family structure, the household. What did it look like? So the first that he deals with is the husband and wife relationship. Husbands and wives have relationships, so that's the first one Paul deals with. That is still true today as it was in Paul's day. Secondly, Paul looks at the relationship between children and parents. Again, something that still exists today in most households and something that existed in his day. But lastly, thirdly, Paul looks at the relationship between slaves and masters. Something, again, we would consider abhorrent slavery in our world today and is illegal in Canada. Like, you can't own slaves. It's not allowed in our structures anymore. But for Paul's day, those three relationships, husband, wife, parent, child, and slave and master, that's what made up the family structure, was those three relationships. And, and the family structure was very important for their culture, and I think it's still very important for all our culture as well, though, in very different ways. So just keep that in mind, especially as we read uh, the first two verses of Paul here, which deal with the husband and wife relationship. And this is what Paul says. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And all the husbands said, Amen. <laughs> no, probably not. No husbands say that in today's world. Like I said, our culture has changed quite a bit <clears throat> since Paul wrote these words 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> However, I do think that those words, especially the first part of it, the submission part, we often take very much out of the context of what Paul is actually trying to say. And I think we hinder our own faith growth and our own understanding of faith in the Bible and, and Christianity as a whole if we just rule out these verses as, as old school ways of life that have nothing to say for us today in our world as we know it. And yes, I know that's easy for me to say because I'm a man and I'm a husband. <laughs> And it's easy for me to look at those words and be like, yeah, that's okay. I can get along with that. Versus the, the women and wives among us who are like, wait a second, what do you mean submit? We question that word a little bit. But bear with me as we, I want to open up the context of these verses a little bit more. Because our modern ear, again, our modern sensibilities, we struggle <coughs> when we hear these words. Because, again, our culture has changed so much from Paul's day. But in Paul's days, the, the submission of the wife was completely commonplace. The wife would submit to the husband, no questions, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It was seen as proper conduct, and that's just all there was to it. That's the context that Paul's writing in. 
But it helps us recognize something. One thing that helps us recognize is the legal state of affairs of Paul's day, which were very different than our day today. It helps us recognize that in Paul's day, 2,000 years ago, in, in Asia Minor, where the Colossian church is located, men, and therefore husbands, were the only fully legal person of the household. They were the only one that could legally own property, or like they didn't have voting, but if they voted, the man was, were, was the only one who could do that. The man was the only one who could kind of control the house and, and do all those things. That was the husband's job. He was the only fully legal person. The children, the wives, the slaves, they, they weren't fully legal people 2,000 years ago. Of course, that's changed today, and I think that's a good thing. Well, I know that's a good thing. I shouldn't say I think that. I know that's a good thing. <laughs> Let me clarify that. The man had power over all the property and over every member of the family. And I think we read this, and we might wish that Paul challenged the norms of his society much more than he does. But a lot of my reading this week led to the conclusion that like Paul doesn't challenge this understanding of, of wife and husband relationship further because to challenge it more than he actually does would most commentators think push people further away from faith in Christ as opposed to bringing them to Christ because the family structure was important and people already saw Christians as this kind of no good Nick group that just tried wanted to cause trouble and chaos in the world by not obeying certain laws of the government because they went against God's laws. And so to challenge the family structure of the day would have pushed people a lot further away from Christ and not closer to Christ. But I also think that we hear the word submit and we often misunderstand the word submit. Because submission does not mean some kind of inferiority. If you submit, it does not mean you're inferior. Though many in our culture, I think we assume that is the same thing. You submit, you're inferior. Like, it, it's just one and the same. But for Paul, the word that he uses here, I think, submission becomes a cooperative idea. Where you, you choose cooperatively to put the other person first. I submit to you, which means I'm putting you first above myself and my own needs. And Christ calls all of his followers in the Bible to a life of submission. A life of putting others first. Because remember, Jesus first submits himself. And I don't think any of us would look at Jesus as inferior or weak. But Jesus lives a life of submission, calling others to a life of submission because of that. And he submits all the way to death, all the way to the cross. So submission doesn't mean inferiority. Submission does not mean weakness. Rather, submission is something that all followers of Christ regardless of how old we are, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of our gender. All followers of Christ are called to submit because that's what Jesus first does. Jesus submits to us, therefore we should submit to others. And it's worth noting that Paul's words here are not one-sided. Because husbands get a command as well, a demand placed on the husbands, which was to love their wives and to not be harsh with them. Love your wives, husbands. Do not be harsh with them. Again, going back to that submit idea, it implies a voluntary submission, something the wife chooses to do, not something she has to do. It's not something forced on you, rather something you choose. And Paul further qualifies that submission of the wife by this final statement. Submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And I think we read the first part and we just totally forget about the second part of those commands. As is fitting in the Lord. So what's fitting in the Lord? And I would fathom to guess that that is determined by custom and tradition. The custom of Paul's day was different than the custom of our day. The tradition of Paul's day and what was fitting in the Lord was different than the tradition today. And so what we would say is fitting in the Lord would probably be different than what they would have said 2,000 years ago. And so you only submit so long as it's fitting in the Lord. And if it passes and isn't good in the Lord, then you stop doing it. You don't do that anymore. Custom and tradition. What is fitting in the Lord? I mean, I think each individual relationship figures that out. And Paul does, again, place commands on the husband, which in his day would have been essentially unheard of. Wives had duties and husbands just, you do whatever you want. You're good to go, sir. 
You do what you want. You have authority. Your rights, your authority, they're a matter of principle. Like, it's not even you should have them. You do have them no matter basically what. The, the husband's authority and rights, they were assumed to challenge those rights, to challenge that authority. Could be dealt with in very harsh ways in Paul's day, even up to, like, in physical, like, beating, like, abusive ways. And, and, we, and we need to keep in mind as well that the point of marriage in Paul's day wasn't love. How many of you married for love? All of us, basically, that have been married, right? We've all married for love. How many of you married to produce legitimate heirs? None of you, apparently. We marry in our world today for love, not to produce children, although that's often a byproduct of marriage. Not always, but often. In Paul's day, it was reversed. You, the, the purpose of marriage in Paul's day was to produce legitimate heirs, and if you got love out of it, fantastic. That was a, a happy thing if it happened, but it wasn't the expected thing. So our culture has changed quite a bit in our views on marriage. But in these verses from Paul, it's clear that he's challenging the societal norms of his day by telling the husbands, commanding them, demanding that they love their wives, because that was not expected in his day. Love your wives. So wife, you submit to your husband's love. You don't submit to his tyranny. You don't submit to his abuse. You don't submit if he's a bad guy. We're just going to go with bad guy because I can think of a million other words, but probably not proper for church. You don't submit to tyranny or abuse. You submit to his love. You submit to how he treats you and how he's righteous towards you and how he loves you. And of course, if the husband loves his wife, as Paul commands him to, then the husband's never concerned about his rights. The husband's willing to forego his rights so that his, to love his wife more fully. So you forego your rights as a husband, that's what Paul's essentially saying, and love your wife no matter what. You don't get to choose, you have to love her. And you have to, don't treat her harshly. <clears throat> and I think that's <clears throat> the context of this first part of that is that submission one isn't a bad thing. In fact, I think all of us as Christ followers are called to submit. But love is also important. You submit to love, not to anything else. But Paul continues, and so we've got husband and wife kind of blurry in the background there. What about children, parents, and children? The next two verses, this is what Paul says. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Now notice right away the difference of what a wife is told versus what a child is told. Wives are told to submit. Children are told to obey. I think we'd all agree there's a difference between submit and obey, right? Paul often gets blamed for telling wives to obey their husbands, but Paul doesn't actually say it, at least not in Colossians here. Paul says to submit. Children are told to obey. Children in Paul's day, again, were simply viewed as the father's property. The father could do whatever he wanted with the children, no questions, no holds barred. There was no status for children. There was no legal status, no organization like Children's Aid Society to protect them from a father who didn't take care of them or was abusive or something along those lines. The command for children to obey. I think most of us as parents would say, yes, please, I'd like more of that. I want my children to obey more. Because <laughs> it, it drives me bonkers when they don't listen and they don't behave and they don't obey me because like, the house would function so much better if they did. So I think we, we might get along with this one a lot easier, especially as parents, compared to the expectations of the husband and wife. But again, in, in Paul's day, a child obeying his or her parents was universally expected. Like there was no other way. Children, you obey your parents. End of story. No questions asked. But this command does assume, I think, that parents, or in this case fathers, don't demand anything bad from their children. They don't demand anything illegal or anything unseemly of their children. It takes for granted, I think, that the parent has the child's best interest at heart and that they don't want to harm or hurt the child or lead them to danger in any way. And children are told to obey their parents, but parents, and here specifically fathers, 
are told not to embitter their children, not to cause them to feel bitter or resentful towards their father, or even for us today, their mother. Because the father's discipline, it could take any form the father wanted it to. All the way like to like, well, I'm gonna, I, I'm putting you to death because you've done such a terrible thing. We, again, different cultures. But the father's discipline, I think, for Paul has to be tempered by the virtues that we talked about last week. The virtues that are good things that we talked about. And it, so it's the parent's obligation to discipline the child. However, that discipline has to happen under the auspices of those virtues from last week. It has to happen. Discipline has to be full of mercy and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and love. The virtues we talked about last week, and I think that's why Paul lists those virtues first and this after the fact. Because the concern in Paul's day is that children would turn away from their faith and the faith of their parents because the parents' discipline was so severe. Stern and heavy-handed parenting drives children away, makes them discouraged. And that's not to say that you just lay down and let them have their way with the world. But you discipline them in ways that are merc full of mercy and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and love. If your discipline doesn't fall under those things, then you're disciplining wrong. I think is what Paul would say. And so Paul challenges his, the societal norms of husband and wife by demanding the husband to do anything. <laughs> he, de he, he also challenges here the parent-to-child relationship by saying that the father owes the child anything. And last but not least, Paul deals with the relationship between slave and master. And this is what Paul writes. <clears throat> Slaves, Obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Now, again, given the fact that slavery is not only abhorrent in our culture, but illegal in Canada in the 21st century, it's difficult for us to imagine a context where the Bible talks about the proper relationship between a slave and a master. And, and again, this is where the context kind of becomes so important because in Paul's day, slavery was commonplace. It doesn't mean it was good. It just means it was accepted at that point in time. It was commonplace. It was essential to their, the fabric of how their society ran. If you owed somebody something, then you could pay them back by offering yourself to them as a slave. That was how society functioned. It was the fabric of how they worked. Paul in these verses, he's not saying slavery is good, but he does encourage obedience of the slaves because they've said, well, I'm going to do this for you because of this. And they're a part of the family household of the day. And again, a household consisted of a father and a mother, a husband and a wife, children and slaves. Now the challenge here from Paul is in the fact that he places any commands on the master to the slave. That would have been unheard of in Paul's day, because most texts of Paul's day, when, you talk, when they talk about this master and slave relationship, most of the texts that they have now are focused on how to get the most efficient slaves, how to beat them most effectively so that you get the most out of them. That's what most texts are interested in, but Paul's not interested in being getting the most out of your slave. Rather, Paul seems interested in a mutual respect between the two parties. So slaves respect your masters, but masters respect your slaves. That would have been unheard of, again, in, in Paul's world. And Paul does place limits on what the masters could do, something that would be unheard of in his day. Because slaves, like women and children, they had no legal rights. Paul challenges this by commanding that, that slaves are dealt with rightly and fairly. You must deal with them justly. You must be fair to them. 
And it's easy again for us to look at these commands and, well, Andrew, these things are outdated, they're uncivilized, these are things we don't have to worry about in today's world because our culture is so different. This has nothing good to say to us for today. Because slavery is outlawed, wives have the same rights as husbands, and children have entire organizations to protect them in cases where the parents do not. But Paul's focus was not to turn the world upside down by challenging the societal norms. <coughs> Paul's focus is on how to live within one's cultural framework as you seek to submit yourself to Christ and be obedient to Christ. So he's not trying to turn the world upside down completely, but he is challenging the norms of his day by suggesting that husbands owe their wives anything, by suggesting that fathers owe their children anything, and suggesting that slave, that masters owe their, their slaves anything. And so that's where he's challenging the norms of his day, because it wouldn't have been expected for those parties to have demands placed on them. It just wasn't the way of the world then. And we struggle with the norms of society, because our norms are very different. Right? Our norms are very different today. But I think the principles that underlie these commands are universal. And these are the principles that I think are universal that we can take with us today. Submission to one another, love, service, obedience, and fairness of work. All of those are values, virtues even, that Christ called us to have by his own example. And I think those are all things that we can agree would be beneficial, not only for our family life, but for our church life, for our outer community life, for our business life, for our meetings life, for like life overall would be far better in our politics and in our family units and our meetings and our church communities if we practiced submission to one another, if we practiced love for one another. Because again, love isn't a feeling, love is an action. If we practiced and tried to serve each other more fully, obey each other, gave each other jobs and work to do that was fair so that not one person or two people were expected to do all the work, but there was a group of people working together on the work, making it much more fair. And I think our lives would be much more fulfilled, our communities would be much more fulfilled if in all of our relationships we practiced those things much more often for each other. It would be more fulfilling because all of us would be more like Christ. Because <laughs> Christ submits himself. Christ loves others. Christ dedicates himself in service to others. Christ obeys like God, even to the point of death. And Christ believes in a fairness of work and justice for those who do the work. And so if we become more like Christ, that could help heal a lot of hurt that the church has caused over the years, but even we as individuals cause to each other sometimes if we just submitted to one another and said, you know what, my needs and wants don't matter. I'm going to submit my needs and wants to you, to your needs and wants, because that's what Christ did. Christ submitted himself first, so I will submit. And when we refuse to obey, when we demand that people listen to us and we take this kind of my way or the highway attitude, I think we're doing a, a disservice to all of our relationships, both in the church, but in the community at large. So submit yourselves to one another, love one another, obey, serve, and let's be fair to each other in all of our family relationships, all of our work relationships, all of our church relationships. So we've got a new song to sing this morning. Um, so you won't find it in your hymn books, but we are going to sing it for all the Sundays moving forward into Christmas and possibly even sing it on Christmas Eve as we prepare ourselves for our wonderful counselor, um, mighty God, Prince of Peace, Savior of the world, Jesus. Um, and so the song is called Wonderful Counselor, so please uh, listen in and, and join along as you feel comfortable as we sing. Thank you. 
So it's been wonderful to be able to connect with all of you this morning, and I do hope that you go from this time of worship, wherever you might be, knowing that we in the church love you, knowing that God loves you, and we hope you can join us next week as we complete the Colossian letter with the rest of chapter 4, and we have gone through the whole thing as of next week, so you won't want to miss it. Go in peace.